Uh, welcome to uh, day two of the New Orleans uh, Book Festival here at Tulane. Thank you very much for uh, joining us today for this vital conversation. Uh, my name is Rene Sanchez. I am back home as the relatively new editor of the Times-Picayune, and we are delighted to be a... Uh... Thank you. Uh, we are delighted to be a sponsor of this, one of the sponsors of uh, this great event. Before we begin, just a couple things to know. Uh, it's a 45-minute conversation. Uh, uh, with about 10 minutes or so left, uh, there'll be time for questions. Uh, if you look, you'll see a microphone uh, right around row three there. Uh, and as you would expect, we'd ask everybody to kind of turn off your phones so there'll be no uh, uh, disruptions as the conversation proceeds over the next uh, 45 minutes. Uh, so with that, what I would like to do is introduce our two uh, wonderful guests. Uh, who we are so fortunate to have. And I'll begin with Elizabeth Alexander. Uh, Elizabeth is a renowned poet, playwright, essayist, essayist scholar. Uh, her book, The Trayvon Generation, which is the focus of today's conversation, is a powerful meditation on how art and culture so vividly shines a light on the ongoing sort of unresolved problems of race in our country. Elizabeth is a former Yale University professor, chair of its Ac African American Studies Department, and she's currently the president of the Andrew Mellon Foundation. And last but not least, in 2009, uh, Elizabeth graced the historic inauguration of President Barack Obama by reciting her po poem, Praise Song for the Day. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you. And our moderator today is Darren Walker. Uh, Darren is the president of the Ford Foundation, which one of, is one of the world's largest foundations dedicated to social justice and the essential proposition that everyone should be treated with dignity. Darren is also the author of the new book, From Generosity to Justice, A New Gospel of Wealth. And since today we are all sitting here in Louisiana, I would like to strongly encourage everyone also to take a few minutes at some point soon and take a look at Darren and Ford's beautifully crafted video called Towards a Just South, which reflects his deep commitment and his inspiring call to all of us to make this region of America a better, more equitable place. Thank you, Darren, and take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you, Renee. And thank you, Dr. Elizabeth Alexander, for coming today to share with us your vision, your passion, the inspiration for this book. And before we talk about the Trayvon generation, just a reflection, your extraordinary career that has spanned the Academy the world of philanthropy, obviously the joy and privilege of uh, being commissioned by the president to present the historic poem on that historic moment. And of course, uh, as uh, among the most prominent uh, African-American women uh, of your generation in the humanities, the arts, what does it feel like to be in New Orleans on this Saturday? <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a wonderful, wonderful way to open our conversation. I'm so happy to be with you, child of Louisiana, here in your home state, on your, on your soil. Um, and I am so happy to be in New Orleans. You know, past is present here. These are my observations, the sense of history and culture and how you do things, which is to say tradition and culture and the things that people carry, even when they are not resourced to do so, is as powerful here as I have ever seen it anywhere. You know, the last time I was here was when I worked with you at the Ford Foundation and we came together because there was so much extraordinary 
work happening here that Ford was partnering with. And <laughs> the day ended, as it should, in a bar with some music and some dancing. <laughs> and what I remember that was, was so beautifully illustrative of this sense of what people carry is that at about 100 o'clock in the morning, uh, after the dancing was done and the band was done, someone came out with little plastic cups of red beans and rice because we had danced for so long that it was time to have a little snack. And so I, I tell that small story to say that culture does not die. You know, we resource it, we institutionalize it. In our work, we think about ways to help keep it alive. But people carry what they know and how their ancestors got over and did what they did and made their way through difficult times. So that's what I care about sort of more than anything in the whole world. And that's, as a scholar of African American culture, that's what you see over and over and over again. And being here, uh, that's just one of the many, many things that I am, am thinking. Since you asked also, because I think it's important and, and very apt here, wherever I go, I always call the names of the people who came before us. And the first person who brought me here, someone very beloved uh, to me, uh, Janet Hill, who passed away last year. Janet McDonald, some of you might even probably have known her, her, her great mother, her great father, the great Janet McDonald Hill. Um, and when I was 16, she brought me here because she said that I wasn't a complete person because I hadn't seen New Orleans at 16. So I think about Janet and all the people and places uh, and beauty that she introduced me to at that point in my life. So I am very, very happy to be here. Thank you for asking. So let's talk about this uh, critically acclaimed book. The New York Times said it was one of the top 100 books of the year to be published. Uh, what was your inspiration for this book and why call it the Trayvon Generation? Well, you know, when George Floyd, or even before George Floyd was murdered, when we found ourselves in the pandemic, locked down apart from each other, what we also saw which is what we knew, is that black and brown people and poor people were so disproportionately affected by the loss in that pandemic. Many people talk about George Floyd as a moment of reckoning. I don't think of it as a moment of reckoning. It certainly focused our energies, but what happened to George Floyd is the oldest American story there is. And I've been writing about the spectacle of racialized violence and thinking not about what does that mean to people who say, oh my goodness, how terrible for the first time, but rather how does that spectacle affect especially black and brown young people? What does it mean over and over and over again to see these circulated images of our violation? What do we do with that trauma? What I have always offered young people in my teaching, in my writing, in all of my work is I do believe that the extraordinary art and culture and scholarship that has come especially out of black people is a way to, 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 to offer a way to think our way through it, to feel our way through it. So that was the starting point, but it was also a starting point of extreme sorrow because it was the changing same. I wrote about black people responding to the uh, Rodney King beating when that was televised. So if we think about the different technologies, right, in the plantation, people were whipped in full view of everyone. That was the technology of the time. That was the publicness to say, this is an object lesson. This isn't just one person. This could be all of you. Then when you look at the public, public spectacle of lynchings, and the postcards and pictures where you see women and children picnicking and smiling. That was the technology of that time. By the way, never dead. The police who killed Tyree Nichols took pictures of him and circulated those pictures. Then we move forward to Emmett Till. And the technology of that time was his mother saying, I want the world to see what they did to my child. And having his body brought to Chicago the casket open, but more importantly even, and the role of the black press 
to say that Jet Magazine could photograph that picture that told people far and wide what had happened and was a catalyst of the civil rights movement. Rodney King, home video, George Holliday, a white man across the street with an old-fashioned camera. We didn't have our phones then. That was how we knew and gathered around that. So I'm telling you these stories to say that, it, you know, the technologies change, but the spectacle of black violation has not changed, and I want to think about our young people. And so you are the mother of two extraordinary young black men. How, as the mother of two boys, two now men, have you approached even your own personal uh, uh, understanding of how you help them mm -hmm. well, navigate think, and negotiate through this system? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the, uh, I mean, I, I talk about being a mother and being their mother in this book, um, but I also, talk about a theme that I think the great poet Gwendolyn Brooks, and I just talked to a high school teacher uh, about Gwendolyn, teaching Gwendolyn Brooks right now, so thank you for that. Um, our great, great Gwendolyn Brooks, her whole idea that there is no such thing as other people's children. No such thing as other people's children. So Simon and Solomon, my children, their friends, my children, my students over teaching for 30 years, my children, the children on the block, my children, we have got to think that way as a society about what, what it means, you know, our children. And I think that what I want for mine is what I want for all of them. I want them alive. I want them safe. But I also want them joyful. And so that is the kind of, the, you know, the, 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 the conundrum that we're getting at in here. How do we continue to uh, make space for the expression of their joy even as we teach them about the history and about the present that they need to understand in order sometimes even to stay alive. Yeah, you, it's been a theme of your writing, this idea of black joy mm -hmm. and how hard it is to come by often, particularly for black men and boys. Talk a little bit about this idea of black joy. Well, I think that, um, you know, when you consider that black people were brought to this country as chattel slave, legally categorized as three-fifths human being, forbidden by law to read and write, which as a writer, as a professor, I mean to read and write, which is to say the power of critical thinking and knowledge that allows you to understand yourself in place and time and make meaning out of your life, right? A very fundamental kind of thing. How can it be? It's extraordinary. I, I marvel that black people are the people who have kept the promise and hope of this democracy alive all this time. All this time. So I think that in our creativity, in our self-expression, in our cuisine, in all of the ways that we come together and make meaning and make community and make safety and make joy, that is the dead serious business of survival, right? I mean, I don't think actually without that we would have survived. So when I think about black joy, and I love, you know, sometimes when you, you know, look on, you know, uh, social media, there's the hashtag black boy joy, or, you know, black, and there are many beautiful, beautiful things, but I think, and I write about that in, in this book, I mean, that is about our very spirit and survival. Something you also write about in the book is monuments, markers, how we understand the physical representation and manifestation of culture. And obviously, at the Mellon Foundation, you've initiated the largest uh, project, you might want to speak to it, uh, addressing this issue of uh, the memorializing of our history and who is left in and out of that. Well, yes, it's our, our biggest uh, quarter of a billion dollar initiative, the Monuments Project. Um, and the idea is how do we tell our American stories, plural, in space and place? How do we tell our stories in public places? 
how is it that there is such a preponderance of commemorations to the Confederacy as though it was glorious and successful, right? I mean, you know, if you think about that, I'm gonna be going to, to, um, to Berlin next week and thinking about, you know, in Germany, uh, you can't enshrine the Nazis or Adolf Hitler, or not just because of the horror of what they did, but because they lost, right? So that's what, you know, you sort of marvel when you see all over, we, we um, uh, commissioned some really terrific, amazing research from um, uh, uh, the Monuments Lab in Philadelphia, because you couldn't find out how do we tell our stories? How many, for example, Robert E. Lees are there? How many Robert E. Lees are there in places where he never set foot, right? And what would it mean to tell our stories in more ways than just single figures of men, either slave owners or in acts of war, on horses, made of steel, made of stone, large, looming, imposing? That's not all there is to American history. Uh, and there are so many ways that the, you know, what's extraordinary about this country, that you can tell our stories in different ways. And it's been uh, very, very powerful to see the ways that people in communities are doing that hard work, which also, as you know, you all know here, uh, was hard community work to ask, why do we tell these stories and what are more of the stories that we could tell? And, you know, in the book you talk about your time at Yale, you were an undergraduate at Yale, and then yeah. you ended up chairing the FM uh, department. So you have been at Yale a long time, mm -hmm. and you yourself had an epiphany. <laughs> I did. I did. Um, and, you know, so I think th these, these questions are everywhere. Um, I talked about I was... I was at a department chair at Yale. We had very special meetings sometimes in the president's conference room, and we would do whatever our business was. I had been there many times over many years, and one day I looked up at the picture of Elihu Yale, the namesake of the university, and his portrait, appropriately, is everywhere in the university. But what I had not noticed was the enslaved, shackled black child at his side. And so I, I, I borrow a phrase from a fantastic poet named Adrian Su, Chinese American who grew up actually in the shadow of Stone Mountain in Atlanta, the world's largest bas-relief public Confederate monument. And she uses a phrase that I, I gift to all of you because it's amazing, the shock of delayed comprehension. When you see something that you've seen a million times and suddenly you see it and you think, so we're doing our most important business and not talking about this piece of the history, this piece of the wealth, this piece of who belongs and who doesn't belong, this very fascinating piece of the shackled black child and the African-American woman who's the third person ever to be, black person to be tenured at the university who's heading a department. How do we think about all of these things at the same time, how do we tell complete histories? It's really as simple as that. But what was also part of the epiphany is that I realized that, that when I researched it, that painting used to be in one of the dining halls. I ate under that painting the whole time I was an undergraduate. And you know, you might have heard about um, one of the dining hall workers in what was then called Calhoun College and of course, John C. Calhoun wasn't just a slaveholder. I mean, he was an architect of the ideology that justified slavery. And there were scenes in that dining hall in the stained glass that we ate under all the time of uh, enslaved black people picking cotton. And so Corey Menefee, who worked in the dining hall, did notice it. And one day he smashed out the windows. And so, you know, and it was a very, a very, very deep thing. He was arrested. He was charged, he lost his job, and then a conversation about what constitutes a hostile work environment, a very interesting legal conversation, uh, began to emerge. And I think it's, it, it just was also very powerful to think, here are the enrolled students who are saying they're unhappy, and here is the dining hall worker who addresses the issue.
you know, what are we going to what are we going to do with with all of that? So I think this question of monuments, you know, it's the zeitgeist. We're talking about it now. We're living it. Um, it has changed the way that I walk around any place I am and think about what do we remember and how do we give it physical shape. So I always imagine that I am holding a five-year-old's hand and the five-year-old is saying like, what's that? Who's that? Why? How do I feel? I feel small. I feel scared. Or I feel big. Uh, I feel uh, uh, excited. Uh, I feel encouraged. There are so many different ways that monuments can make you feel. Why art? I mean, it's interesting. Uh, you have this beautiful uh, visual imagery uh, peppered throughout the book. Uh, why do you, why art and why did you choose such a rich and interesting range of artists? Well, you know, I, so, I love the book itself. I love books themselves. And what I really believe, and we could start with um, the cover, this is Carrie Mae Weems's Blue Black Boy. And sometimes the visual arts show us things that are beyond words. And I wanted to make a book where the visual art was fully part of the text and in conversation with the words themselves. I wanted it to be a book, I, you know, I'm a poet. This is not a book of poetry, but it's a poet's book. So I wanted it to be a book that you could read through all at once. I wanted it to be a book that you could look at it backwards, that you could just look at the pictures, that you could focus and think about what is the relationship of this picture to what we're reading. I wanted it to be a beautiful and unusual book in that way, but also one that sort of was, it was a book that I wrote after my decades of teaching, but it's a teaching book. So were I teaching a class and talking about, because there are also many poems in this book by other poets, I mentioned Adrian Sue, Natasha Trethewey, uh, Clint Smith uh, from uh, New Orleans, by the way. I'm sure many of you know his amazing, amazing uh, work. Um, I wanted all of that to be in conversation because I don't think that these are both issues that we can solve with one genre, but also I think the multi-genre experience awakens different parts of us. I, uh, when I showed this, the, this picture to my late father, uh, he, he looked and looked and, and looked, and at the time I showed it to him, his language was limited, and he touched him, and he said, I said, what do you see, Daddy? And he said, he is so beautiful, and he is so sad, and we must love him. And this is a piece called Blue Black Boy. So, you know, I, I think that that's just one example of how the visual art can do everything, and kind of reach us mm -hmm. here. You see, you shouldn't have said this because mentioning your daddy, mm. you have to talk about your daddy. He was so special. You know, yes. And we lost him in July after an extraordinary, extraordinary life. And so maybe I'll just read a little bit because I, I talk about him here. Um, there's a curse word. He was a great cursor. Um, I'm going to just like kind of right, right over it. Um, but it's in a section called Free Black Men, which is another way of thinking about, you know, black joy. Uh, the brother I see unabashedly kissing his son goodbye every morning at a nearby school drop off is a free black man to me. Most black jazz musicians are free black men listening for their own strange, unprecedented, and historical selves in the sometimes powerfully non-representational language of music. Free black men who are quiet, free black men who are loud, free black men, some of the things my father taught me, always carry FU money and keep some in the bank no matter what so that you have your own money on you so you can always walk away from the man, the job, the situation and not have it cost you your health, your dignity, your life. This philosophy goes beyond the dime for the emergency phone call. The point was that no white person's job was worth your mental health, period. My father taught me about always speaking up for what you knew was right, even when no one in the room would sign on with you because you never know who would be listening and someone was always listening. He taught me to ignore fools, simply ignore them, reject their paradigm, render them irrelevant, even if they have power over your very livelihood. 
His advice was not always practical, <laughs> but it was soul-saving. And even when you don't act according to that dictum, to have heard it stated is crucial and enabling. He saw his mother work like most black men. His mother was a righteous warrior who taught him things like memorizing badge numbers of Harlem police officers in the 30s and 40s and reporting them for their abuses against black children. My father's first police encounter happened when he was eight. His mother organized a successful campaign against New York City newspapers to get them to stop identifying only black alleged criminals by their race. His own father was a quieter man who taught my father everything about kindness, about decency, hard work, diligence, honor. My daddy taught me freedom. So that's just a little bit about um, how I was fortunate to be raised and what I share at every opportunity. The daughter of Clifford Alexander. Yes. So we're going to go to questions in a moment, but I think the audience would also be interested. You uh, are uh, the president of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the largest foundation committed to the arts and humanities in the country. Uh, you all give away more money than the National Endowment for the Arts, and so you N have- NEA. Put together. And the NEA put together, and the NEH. Which is actually a call for more government funding of these things, but I you noticed know, to mention. So this is true, the NEH and the NEA. And uh, as a, in some ways, you uh, are a gatekeeper. You are an anointer uh, in a way in which uh, black people and black women uh, spaces have not been occupied. Uh, so what do you see as your role uh, sitting at uh, in this very sort of privileged perch mm -hmm. uh, and a different experience probably than your predecessors? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think when I look at the through line because I've had different jobs but I see that they have been animated by some of the same things. Uh, I want justice and I want freedom, period. So what can I do or anybody do from where they stand at any moment in time to contribute to justice and freedom and the empowerment of other people? So that looks one way in a classroom, right? I mean, the beautiful, beautiful, I'm so happy uh, to see uh, my, my, my dear friend, Eddie Gloud, and, and you, who, co you know, companion in this work of teaching African-American culture, and the, the power of empowering people in the classroom. And I have to say this now that we are in a, a, a time of madness in our country, where books are being banned, where the teaching of accurate history is being legislated where it's being legislated that you can't say gay, you can't perform drag, you cannot. We are in a time of madness. And you know, arts and culture and critical thinking are pillars of our democracy. So honestly, it's very brilliant. Go for that stuff and the rest can fall. The rest can fall. And so I think to my teaching experience of all the people who uh, would come through my classrooms and say, why didn't I ever know this? It's amazing to understand this. Nobody felt guilty. <laughs> they were learning. And then charged to go and do something with what they had learned. So I think that, you know, to the, the, the privilege of being a gatekeeper, I think of it as an enabler and an empowerer. Right? That that's what, it, and, 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 and I seek every single day to be able to do more and more, but also to help empower others who empower others, right? Who are of that mindset that we have to, we have to spread what, what we have. So um, it is unusual, you know, I don't know if it's stranger uh, that I'm a black woman doing this work or that I'm a poet doing this work or that I'm a scholar doing this work, I'm not really quite sure. Um, but I think that, you know, I know a whole lot of stuff 
and I know how to make discernments very sharply and quickly, and I know a whole lot of brilliant people who haven't been resourced. I have an infinite supply of brilliant people who haven't been resourced and who are fired up and ready to go. So I think it's actually a very good position from which to be able to do this work. So we welcome questions. And if any of you have questions, uh, please come to the microphone. And uh, I am sure that Dr. Elizabeth Alexander will gladly respond. Yes, ma'am, please. Hi, thank you so much for being here. My name is Andrea Boyles, and I am a sociologist here at Tulane. I'm also an associate dean in the School of Liberal Arts. Um, so I have, um, I'm going to try to make this quick, but I wanted to provide a little context. I am the sociologist and native St. Louis and criminologist that documented from the very start the Ferguson uprising. Mm. And I have to be very clear about that because erasure is real. Yep. And so I was on the ground as an ethnographer capturing and documenting all of these things before the world came in. Thank you um, for that work. It, and so um, it's a humbling experience. Yep. I appreciate yep. the work that you do. Um, I'm also want to, um, I'm, I'm still very thoughtful um, and um, extending grace to those families, those many families. Um, that we continue to talk about. That said, I have also continued to do a lot of public facing work with the expertise in um, black resistance, mm -hmm. um, expertise on black citizen police conflict. You know that in our community especially, there is this sort of um, dichotomous situation happening where um, either are you going to keep viewing this footage yeah, or yeah, not. Yeah, and yeah. so for me, given that I do a lot of public facing work, um, my position had been that I'm going to continue to watch whatever footage comes out because I need to be able to see all of the different angles if I'm going to have conversations with the press, right? Yep, yep. What happened recently is that I had an opportunity talking with the newspaper and was offered to look at some body cam footage from about yeah. maybe four different angles that was yep. probably, believe it or not, um, and, and this is coming from someone who stood in front of tanks. Yep. It was probably the most gruesome that I had seen yet. And it did me. Yeah. Um, yeah in a yeah. very real way. Um, and so I, I guess my question to you is what is your position? Um, it's, maybe that's a personal question and I no, would No, no, no. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that, I mean, that's thank you for what you, uh, what you are saying. And that's at the crux, right? What does it mean to bear witness in the face of erasure that is, is real? And what is, how do we take that? You know, I think about, for me, it was with um, having written, I mean, again, since Rodney King, 30 years, writing about this stuff, looking at this stuff, showing this stuff to students, moving them through it. With Tyree Nichols, I said, and I talked about it with my sons, too, who are now 23 and 24, and we said, we're not going to watch it. Mm -hmm. You know, we've seen enough. And then MSNBC didn't give us that choice. You know, um, there was, which I think, you know, just the idea that there is not, again, an understanding, and I just want to read you something that is an answer to what you said. This is just a little bit from a section that's called Whether the Negro Sheds Tears in this book with an amazing image by Robert Pruitt. In April 1905, a researcher named Alvin Borquist at Clark University wrote to the preeminent scholar, activist, writer, theorist, and chronicler of race, W.E.B. Du Bois, at his academic home of Atlanta University. He wrote, Dear Sir, Sir, we are pursuing an investigation here on the subject of crying as an expression of the emotions and should like very much to learn about its peculiarities among the colored people. We have been referred to you as a person competent to give us information on the subject. We desire especially to know about the following salient aspects. One, whether the Negro sheds tears. Now this is 1905, right? And he writes back and says, the Negro sheds tears. And then, you know, I, 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 moving forward in the book, I write, are black people human? 
Are black people human? Do black people do what people do? Are black people people? If black people are not people and do not cry, then we do not experience pain or grief or trauma or shock or sorrow. If black people do not experience pain or grief or trauma or shock or sorrow, are we human? And if we are not human, can our continued violation be justified? Can black people be harmed if they cannot cry to say so? We black people are made mostly of water, blood, and tears. We bleed, we shed oceans of tears. Our waters contain our sorrows. And then I go from there to my own account of watching the Derek Chauvin trial. You know, in that, I think it is a constant pull with bearing witness, again, in the face of real erasure and understanding that we are witnessing the result of people who do not think that we are human. And I do believe that is irreconcilable, except in doing what we're doing right now. So thank you for what you do. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. It's, you know, it's interesting that you raise this issue because it is very much rooted in the reality of the history of this country and the necessity of categorizing black people as subhuman. Yeah. That was essential in order to justify yes. slavery, which was essential in the view of many to have an economy that could build this country. Absolutely, and I think that, you know, that there is, you know, to the local, there's a, a section uh, here about a, a visit that I made to Angola prison. And a photograph, I'm so thrilled to have met, where are you, Chandra McCormick? Where did you go? There you are, there you are. So um, there's an extraordinary photograph in the book, but I hadn't met, I hadn't met Chandra McCormick before. Uh, and, and the picture is, I, I realize you can't see it when I hold it up here, but it's called Daddy-O, uh, the oldest living inmate in Angola prison. And what I talk about in that chapter is, I mean, I don't need to tell you all here, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, it's a plantation. Uh, uh, that 90% of the people who go in die there. Uh, and I witnessed there a, a group uh, that was doing writing and mindfulness. And I listened to the conversations uh, and the, the very profound utterances that the men in that group were having. And when I look at this picture of Chandra's, this man with his hand on his heart, I, I do believe that um, learning and, and, and art mitigates against dehumanization. Um, and so, you know, with the magic wand that I wish I had for so many things, uh, one of them would be the magic wand that, that, that makes people see the humanity through art um, because that is a very powerful way that we, um, and, and the biggest superpower I know, the word, to understand lives that are not our own and thus to have human empathy and understanding. Well, Charles we have Blow. the uh, renowned Let's journalist start. Charles Blow of the New York Times with us today. Right. And I believe he has a question for his friend, right. Elizabeth Alexander. So Elizabeth, you write that one of your successes, one of the things you view as success as a parent is that your boys dance. Yes. Explain that, or why that would be a marker of success. Yes, thank you. Um, and, uh, and let me find, uh, I, I think that it, it always, um, I feel like I said it, I said it better when I said it in the book. Um, so let me see if I can read this. Um, Black celebration is a village practice that has brought us together in protest and ecstasy around the globe and across time. Community is a mighty life force for self-care and survival, but it does not protect against murder. Dance itself will not free us. We continue to struggle against hatred and violence. 
I believe that this generation, I do believe this, is more vulnerable and more traumatized than the last. I think of Frederick Douglass's words upon hearing enslaved people singing their sorrow songs in the fields. He laid waste to the nascent myth of the happy darkie and wrote, slaves sing most when they are most unhappy. Our dancing is our pleasure, but perhaps it is also our sorrow song. My sons love to dance. I have raised them to young adulthood. They are beautiful, they are funny, they are strong, they are fascinating, they are kind, they are joyful in friendship and community, they are righteous in their politics, they are learning, they are loving, they are mighty and alive. I recall many sweaty summer parties with family friends where the grown-ups regularly acted up on the dance floor and the kids DJed to see how quickly they could make their old school parents and play uncles and play aunties holler, hey, that's my jam. They watched us with deep amusement, but they would dance too. One of the aunties glimpsed my sons around the corner in the next room and said, oh my God, they can dance. They've been holding out on us, acting all shy. When I told a sister friend that my older son during his freshman year in college was often the one controlling the aux cord, dancing and dancing and dancing, she said, remember, people dance when they are joyful. Yes, I am saying I measure my success as a mother of black boys in part by the fact that I have sons who love to dance, who dance in community, who dance till their powerful bodies sweat, who dance and laugh, who dance and shout, who are able in the midst of their studying and organizing, their fear, their rage, their protesting, their vulnerability, their missteps and triumphs, their knowledge that they must fight the hydra-headed monster of racism and racial violence that we were not able to cauterize, that they can find the joy and the power of communal self-expression. So thank you for that question. We are winding down. We do have time for another question and um, appreciation, please. Um, <clears throat> so you have um, really shocked, that you talked about the shock of rec recognition. <clears throat> you have shocked me out of an attitude that I have carried for quite a long time of resentment towards the control of foundations over the funding of the arts and other parts of our lives. Um, because I have never thought about a person running a foundation as somebody who has the power that you have, that you have conveyed to us today, of your emotional and creative life as a person and the people that you've worked with. That said, I still am not comfortable with the controls that corporations, foundations, and um, public officials have over our creative lives. And um, I ask you how you feel about that now that you have, I mean, I, 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 I can't get my arms around a person like you having that kind of a job, in all honesty. <laughs> and so it is, it is no, it is, it is shaking yeah. me up about my assumptions about foundations, the people who run them. So, I mean, uh, there's another person on the stage who challenges those uh, attitudes too, but I need to understand what, what your comfort level is yep. with the way this all works. Th thank you so much for saying that, and, and I'm, I'm, so, um, I'm so glad to hear you in this moment of, of seeing it differently, and I would answer this question with uh, my brother Darren. I'm doing this job because he invited me to do a version of this I didn't job invite you, I drug you against uh, your uh, will uh, from you. I know, I was like, I'm a free woman, I'm a free black woman. Um, but I, but I worked was, I was chairing African American Studies at Yale and Darren said, you could do this work at Ford, being the director of creativity and free expression because of who you are and how you see and what you come from. So I think that you know what I really uh, have taken from that is that there are so many different competencies for doing this work. Uh, you know, philanthropy has a moribund streak. Philanthropy has a self-satisfied streak. Uh, philanthropy has an unquestioning 
uh, gatekeeping to it. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, because when I look at the people who I worked with at Ford and the people who I've brought together, I mean, you know, we had to make a lot of changes at the Mellon Foundation, starting with, I will come if we will now say this is a social justice philanthropy. And understanding that, like, and if that's not what you're comfortable doing, then it's fine. I have a job, you know, um, but that's what I'm here to do and to use the language of wealth redistribution and to use the logic that comes from, again, from African American studies about like, well, how did these people acquire their wealth? And to use what comes from being an artist and a poet, knowing what it takes to try to, you know, piece things together and get the quarter out of the crack in the sofa in order to make your organization, right? Um, and to know that it is partnership, it is not, being in a lordly position. It is rather being in a partnership position. Um, that said, one thing I also know, and you know, and I hope, and I think philanthropy is, is changing. I think that leadership in philanthropy is changing. Um, and I would separate philanthropy from elected officials from corporations because the particularities are a little different. You know, we elect the people we elect. So like, we gotta deal with that, right? Um, and think about what that means, not necessarily you and me individually, but as a, a country, you know, what, what, what does that mean, who we elect? Uh, because, you know, they, they have the power that they have. And of course, corporations have varying purposes, but the purpose of a foundation is always for something that we would broadly define as the good, right? So the people who I work with are people who have tremendous deep knowledge, sensitivity, you know, artistic backgrounds, higher educational backgrounds, um, and who come humbly with respect, with knowledge, and in partnership. So I, I do hope and think that more philanthropy is going in that direction. Do you want to add something to what is happening in philanthropy? Yeah. <laughs> I'd just like to take this occasion as we come to our final 20 seconds to say thank you, Professor Dr. Elizabeth Alexander, for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know I'm going to salute you all too.